Well, Brad, welcome to afl.com.au. It's a pleasure to have a chat with you. Welcome back to coaching as well. First of all, Cal, it's a pleasure to be here too. And um, no, I'm really enjoying being, being back. Uh, there was a little bit of trepidation in terms of, you know, almost three years away and, you know, do, would, would, it, would the game have moved on? And I was fortunate to still be heavily involved in game analysis at, at the AFL. So, yeah, it's probably just like riding a bike back into the routine. And, um, you know, certainly the demands haven't got any less over the last three years. Has it increased significantly? Have you found that? I don't think it's necessarily significant. I, I, I think the, the challenge of the whole world of the last three years has meant that you know, most industries, and certainly ours, has been cut back. So in a lot of ways, football clubs are, are putting the pieces back together a little bit. Um, yeah, and so that that's certainly different. I, I miss that, that era. The, the football department resources were certainly different three years ago to what they are now, but you know, slowly getting back on their feet. You mentioned getting like riding a bike, what type of bike rider are you second time around? Are you a little bit different to the first? How, how do you foresee yourself being um, in your second go at it? Well, I don't think I'm a different rider. I think that the, the difference this time is I have a, a much better understanding of what to expect. You know, the first time around in anything really, but certainly the, you can be an assistant coach for as long as you like, but until you sit in the chair of a senior coach, you never really understand um, all the challenges and the the different demands. So I go in eyes wide open this time. And, you know, I think I have a much better understanding of where to spend my time and, and what to focus on um, and the things to probably um, focus on less. What drew you back to this role? There's been other opportunities over the past couple of years that could have popped up as well. What was it about the Essendon job that, that made you want to go for it? Yeah, it, it and look, I was really happy at the AFL. So in the initial um, approach, while I was flattered, I, you know, I was really comfortable doing what I was doing. So um, you know, Essendon certainly persisted and, and sold a story. And the thing that, that, amongst many things, but the real tipping point came when you know, I could tell that the club were really keen to focus back on football and to have that, that focus on their core product, which is um, you know, members, players um, and footy. And you know, that's what I love doing. I love spending time with, with players and developing players. And... And part of the, the challenge of being a senior coach is that you get taken away from that at times in different areas. And Essendon certainly assured me that, that I'd be able to focus on that task and spend time developing the team and the players. Have you seen that come through in terms of the focus in, on footy from a whole club-wide perspective in the first few months? Yeah, well, well, well so far, um, it's been really encouraging. You know, we've, um, we've had a really solid pre-season and, and you know, the, the challenge for us is that our games haven't been played yet, so you know, I think just about every club is pretty comfortable with where they are right at the moment at this stage of the pre-season. Um, you know, and that's partly because you're training and playing against yourselves. So our, our, our challenge will come when, when we play a really good opposition, of which that's the whole competition these days. So um, yeah, the focus on footy has been good so far, but we've got a long way to, to one, build the football department to what we want it to be. And that's a world-class football program. Um, and that's post-COVID, but also, you know, that focus back for Essendon on footy um, rather than, you know, some of the peripheral things around a footy club. You mentioned the game analysis role. I don't know if you've got a notebook or if it's just in your mind, but how much do you tap into the things you, you did pick up and how much, you know, use have they been in the first few months back in the role as well? No, I, th I think it's, it's, it's helpful just having an understanding of the, looking at the game through a different lens. As a coach, you, 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 you really are drilling down on what's important to to winning and and trying to avoid the things that contribute to losing. Uh, the game analysis at the AFL was a lot more on what the game looks like as a whole and making it a really compelling product, you know, largely for the fans. Um, that's a really difficult role because no one likes any rule changes generally. Uh, but everyone I've spoken to while I was at the AFL always had one rule they wanted to change. So everyone wants no change except for the one that they want changed. Um, so it's a really difficult role from that perspective. Uh, but I certainly look at the game now with, you know, through both lenses, that it's really important what the game looks like, but then you know, it's hard to take your football coach hat off when you are analysing the game at, at an AFL level. I'm interested, just before we move on, uh, you're in the red and black. Obviously, Brisbane had a pretty good rivalry uh, with the Bombers during your career. Then North Melbourne, pretty local rivals. How 
long did it take you to get used to the colours when you look in the mirror and chuck on the polo? Yeah, well, a lot of people said everyone looks good in, in red and black, so it uh -huh. uh, wasn't, wasn't um, too difficult. But um, no, I, look, I think that you know, I've been really fortunate to be involved in a number of different clubs through my uh, AFL career. And you know, they're, they're, they're more similar than they are different. So you know, the, the, the thing about Essendon, though, is they were a powerhouse through my playing days, a lot, lot more so than some other um, big Victorian club. So um, they were always a, a fierce rival. And you know, whenever you played Essendon, you knew it was going to be you know, a, a big game. And that was regardless of where it was played. You know, I've got vivid memories of playing big games at the Gabba against Essendon. And you know, the, the Essendon faithful are everywhere. They're not just in Victoria, they're national. Essendon's got the, sun, the second youngest list heading into the this season this year. Two players over 30. What does that mean in terms of the expectations of what Bomber supporters can be looking for from their team this year? Yeah, well, I, a few people have said, you know, we're going to play the young guys. And um, the answer is I don't think we have any alternative. Um, you know, we, we have a, a, a young team. But that I think that Essendon supporters understand that with a young team, there are going to be some challenges with probably consistency of performances both from game to game, but also within game. Um, but, you know, I really encourage fans to, to get on board and enjoy the journey and watch some of these young players grow and develop and improve. And as I said at the start, that's what I love doing. I love working with players and trying to maximise their potential. And, you know, I hope Essendon fans can, can see these players, you know, improve week by week. What did you have a view on the list when you came in and how's that differed or altered with time? Yeah, this. I mean, the the obvious players that that everyone knows and that I've admired from afar for a long period of time: Dyson Heppel, Zach Merritt, etc. Um, but it's the players I didn't know much about, and really by name only, and and watching them. Um, a couple of guys who made their debut, but there are some some young players who've got some some real capability, and um, yeah, I think sometimes we in this industry, and probably you, Cal, as much as most, because if you your love of the draft and the talent pathway. Now, sometimes you can you can have a view on a player based on where they were drafted. And now I've always um, tried to look at every player equally. And once you're at a footy club, it doesn't matter where you were drafted. And some of our players who weren't drafted at all, they were taken through you know either mid-season drafts or SSPs, um, have been really really impressive. And if I didn't know where they were taken, you know I would assume they were high draft picks. I won't put words into your mouth, but the Sam Durham and Nick Martin are a couple that have had pretty strong preseason. We'll get to some more players shortly, but those guys look to have been um, pretty good across the, the summer. Yeah, they, they've they've um, they've really impressed me, and and um, didn't know a lot about them. I mean, I, I watched Sam Durham in particular because he was um, a rising star candidate, um, and that that committee that that votes on the rising star were watching him pretty closely week to week, and. Um, so I knew a bit about him, but um, but he's 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 better than that. He's better than than what I saw last year, um, you know. And and you know what he does on the training tracks, you know, really impressive. So he's got a lot of growth and and a lot of improvement. And and you know, Nick Martin is just a great story. You know, he wasn't on an AFL list. Um, came through the SSP a couple of weeks later, is kicking five goals in his debut against Geelong. So. He's got some obvious capability, but with a full preseason under his belt, you know, we really expect him to, to improve from last year. There's probably a trend in some defeats last year. How much have you dug into last year's performances, either yourself personally or, or with the group as well, to see what was happening and, and how things can be different or changed or, or kept as well in different parts? I, I, my focus has been on, on making sure that we retain all the, the good things that were happening. And you know, from the outside, there can be a perception that you know, a club's either going really well or they're in turmoil. I mean, there's very little in between. And the reality is the, the Essendon Football Club, particularly the football department, you know, is in good shape. You know, there's, there's a lot of good people in here. And you know, if you look at the coaching group, um, you know, pretty much all of them are still here. Um, all the assistant coaches, um, you know, the medical team, you know, we, we're looking to improve it all the time, but there are a lot of good things happening. And so my first... Uh, port of call was to retain all of those things before we layer in uh, some things that we want to improve on. But, but quite simply, uh, for us, we've got to improve every part of our game. And you know, we're, not, we're not comfortable 
with where we sit in any phase, whether it be the contest, our offense or defense. Most people probably don't expect the buyers to be challenging given the, the list um, demographics at the moment. How do you see progress or how, how would you view progress from what it was last year to this year? I, I think it's, it's the easy way to measure it is, is probably ladder position, but the competition doesn't work that way. You know, it's, the, but if you look at, if you did a, a list analysis of the, you know, the top eight teams from last year, you could make a strong argument that they've all got better. They've all got better on paper. Um, and yeah, you know, there are another six or seven teams that would really expect, you know, to push to, to play finals. So it always amuses me when people say that, you know, this team should play finals next year, but they're, they're reluctant to sort of say who the four or five teams who are going to go out. So I think the competition generally, for, to my eye, is going to get better in 2023. So that makes improvement difficult to judge in terms of ladder position. But what I think we can judge is the, the improvement at a micro level in terms of the way we play, but also you know the development of individual players. Let's talk about the captaincy. Dyson Heppel stood down. How did that process play out? Yeah, it was, um, again, I, I, Dyson was one of the first um, play or he was one of the, the first people I sat down and had a coffee with when I was first appointed and um, you know, I remember when Dyson was drafted and watching him as, a, as an underage player and you, you know, it's fascinating watching these players come through their career and I've always had a lot of time for him. You know, he's had some real challenges with injuries over the last couple of years but I, I probably underrated his leadership um, externally uh, because you, you, know, you're, you can only judge on what you see on field and you know, that, that's been impressive, but he's far more impressive than that behind the scenes. And he's, a, a, he's one of those players who really rallies players together. And, and you know, this, our club's been through some difficult times over the last you know, little period, and he's been a mainstay in keeping that together. So I was really keen for him to continue, um, but ultimately he, he's, he's made the decision to, to step down from the captaincy, um, you know, which I have to respect. and. Um, you know, he's going to focus on his footy and, and part of the reason he's, he, he wants to step down is he feels there are emerging leaders coming through and he wants to support them while he's still playing. Tell us about your involvement with Zach since joining the club and what his ambitions like as well because he's been such a driven and successful player really since he's joined the club. Yeah, he, he's a really, really impressive player. And the, the, when, you, when you think of the, the really good players over time, they they share some common traits and, and the main one being just competitiveness. Um, but a lot of players have got competitiveness, but then there's, there's another level of just will to win. And uh, I think that's been a challenge for Zach in the past because, you know, there, there are some analogies with other players who I've played with and against who, you know, that will to win can sometimes um, push into the, the space of being really hard on your teammates and expecting your teammates to be just as good as you are in those areas. And because Zach's such a good player, um, he has demanded a lot from his teammates. But I think over, over time, you know, he's learned that he needs to, to relate to people in a different way and they can't all be like him. Um, and they are different. And in the five months I've been here, he, is, um, he has not put a foot wrong. He's uh, led by example on the track. And um, yeah, he's, he's been, again, uh, I always knew he was a good player, but I've been pleasantly surprised on the upside. Do you think you'd be ready for the role? Yeah, I think he and, and, and there are a couple of others. We're fortunate in that we have um, you know, a handful of guys who, who are capable, but we also need to have a, a, a really good understanding that we need better depth in our leadership. We need to bring some guys through. So arguably as important as our official uh, leaders in 223, it'll be the program we've put underneath with the the sort of that, those players in the mid-20 age demographic to bring them through so they can be the next leaders of the club. Have you dealt a lot with them already about that? And, and have you seen those guys come through? There's a, there is a, a core group that's there and sort of ready to take that step up, it seems. Yeah, th th there is. And, and you know, pa part of the, the, the reason, you know, I wanted to keep a really open mind is that I think once you, the, the club makes decisions, they're hard to undo. So, um, you know, we, we've got to spend 12 months really developing our leaders and, and you know, appealing to their strengths. And we, we do have a lot of players who, who lead really strongly in certain areas and other players who do it quite differently. And I think that shared leadership model is really important for us. We want, we want 
um, you know, Zach Merritt, and, um, you know, Andy McGrath to be to lead in what, where they're good, and we want other players to to lead in 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 other areas. Zach and and Andy are, you know, the the highly driven, motivated players, and we have other players who probably are a little bit more laid back, but they're really important in terms of the group dynamic and. Dyson certainly fits into that mould as well. Zach leads in midfield at the very least, which is probably the strength of the list at the moment. Have you settled on what your starting square looks like in round one? Because there has been a rolling through throughout trainings. I've seen Merritt and Parrish and Shield in there a lot. Yeah. How's it sort of looking from that perspective? Uh, oh, certainly not settled. Um, they're, they're very capable players. And, you know, we have been quite strong on synergy. So we want, um, you know, those those sort of players working together but you know Jai Caldwell's been really impressive you know Will Setterfield has just um, you know impressed everyone with everything he's done um, Archie Perkins is coming through you know Cole Langford's you know plays everywhere on the ground but but has certainly spent some time as an inside midfielder for us so um, you know there there are a lot of options through there which I think put us in a good spot so um, yeah far from settled you got Will Setter through, through the trade period last year at a pretty good rate, bargain rate, and also uh, Sam Wiedemann. How's the, the forward line settling up as well? Because there's been a few little niggling injuries for those key forwards of Peter Wright and, and Sam as well, and, and Harry Jones too. What does it look like in your mind? Yeah, well, Peter Peter's clearly, you know, announced himself as a dominant key forward in the competition, and he's he's actually had a really good pre-season. He had a minor hiccup um, with a very minor calf strain which we were very conservative with um sam the same sam had it uh, sam wiedemann's had a very good pre-season and impressed everyone so um you know they they would be pro probably obvious candidates to to play in our forward half but then we have a good problem in that you know, harrison jones got a lot of uh capability a bit interrupted with his pre-season so um you know but but seeing them in combination ha has been really good and yeah, you know, them you know, guys like Baldwin and Voss have been uh, have had their moments where they've been really impressive too. So while it's not ideal to have players out, having having Wright and Wiedemann miss a couple of weeks meant that we could expose you know Baldwin and Voss with Stringer, um, you know with Waller, those sort of guys. So yeah, I would say that we have more options available to us than I probably thought we would back in November. Speaking of more options, last year Essendon probably relied on Matt Guelphie for its small forward stocks. Uh, Anthony Matola too, what he didn't play last year. You mentioned he's back. He, he kicked yep. a couple of goals in match practice uh, earlier this week. We've seen the emergence of John Menzi across summer too. Alan Davey has been pretty impressive as well. Are you yep. pretty happy with that group of small forwards now that you, you've got to choose from? Well, well again, it's, it's just amazing how, how quickly you know things can change because, w w yeah, it's fair to say we, we had some concerns in, in that area. Um, yeah, you know, and that's that's where, you know, in terms of building our list and and that open mind that I talk about all the time is really important because, you know, in November we thought, you know, certainly prior to the national draft, we thought we had, you know, probably we were a bit light on for small forwards and and you know, Will Snelling and these guys have played, you know, Will's played 50 games of, of AFL footy now and he's very capable in that role. Uh, but then Waller comes back, um, you know, Guelphie's had a really good year. John Menz is coming through. You know, we'll see Alwyn Davy at some point this year, and and yeah, you know, the following year we'll see Jaden Davy. So, you know, what what was probably a area of weakness for us in November is potentially a strength in a year's time. What about Waller? What has he got to do over the next fortnight or what three weeks to be showing you that he's ready for the start of the season if he's in that frame? Yeah, he's just got to keep playing. I mean, the the my, my message to him and um, has been to get him conditioned well enough to enable himself to train hard enough and that's a really important distinction because we could just throw him out and and run him and try and get him as fit as quickly as possible but it would be fitness built on a really low base so there's nothing that will be a substitute for time but for him so now whether that's round one whether it's later in the year um you know we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna sort of rush to get him back in because we need him. Um, we want to get him back in fit and ready to go. So he's done the vast majority of pre-season. He's done all our match sim um, and he'll play in our practice game. So that gives him a chance. I've enjoyed coming to training and seeing Eddie McGrath playing off half-back. 
has he enjoyed being there? And, and what have you, your message been to him about that role and, and really nailing it? Well, he's really helped me because, you know, the, my, my strong message has been that we want to maximise players' strengths. And, you know, that you can say that, but then what are the actions that actually um, back that up? And you know, I talked to Andy about where he plays his best footy. And again, I had an open mind. It wasn't a matter of just moving him back. It was a, a process of working through what does his best footy look like? You know, what's the role that best suits that? Um, and we've taken a different attitude. We haven't looked at the team and said, we've got weaknesses in this part of the ground, so we'll move players into that spot. It's been about trying to get players into the slot that really suits them. Now that's not perfect because we've got 45 players on our list. So not everyone gets to play as an inside midfielder. But for Andy to say, no, I, I think I play my best footy across half back. And for the rest of the playing group to see that, uh, I think it's been really helpful. What about your fitness heading up to the first competitive game? How many players do you sort of anticipate to use across that game against the Suns? And obviously a couple of guys will be missing. A couple of guys that SMF fans are pretty excited about in the future. And they are Nick Cox and, and, and Zach Reid. How are they tracking? Yeah, they're going well, uh, but again, um, I'm the most frustrating guy for those two because they've got a, a program to, to get them back to, to training fully and playing. But you know, I've said to both of them that I'm a lot more concerned about the next 12 years than I am the next 12 weeks. Um, yeah, and they're, 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 they're young, driven kids who want to play. Um, and you know, it's probably me holding them back more than anyone else. So, yeah, and that'll be the same for Elijah Sardis, who you know, is, is a as you well know, a very motivated, driven young man, and, and he wants to get back and play. But we just, with those particular players, we won't do anything um, to, to the detriment of their future um, to try and service the short term. Do you like Cox at halfback? Did, did you think it was where he was starting to fit in? Yeah, I, I don't know is the easy answer because he, he's done nice things forward, back and midfield. Um, yeah, and you sort of, the flexibility that a player like Cox, he gives you from a coaching perspective is huge. You know, he's, he's ruck size, you know, he's in our best running group. Um, you know, he kicks left and right. He's a pretty complete player, um, but he's young and he, and he still needs to develop. And you know, part of the reason we're being very conservative with, with Reed and Cox is that, you know, they're 200 centimetres plus, um, they've had some stress injuries and yeah, the temptation is just to roll them out as soon as they're, they're healthy, um, but then they break down again. So we'll be really conservative. And um, yeah, so where Coxie ends up playing, you know, I couldn't give you an honest answer at the moment. The middle man in that 2020 draft was Archie Perkins, and a lot of Essendon supporters are pretty excited to see what he can produce in his third year. How do you use him? Is he a potential point of difference for you in the middle? Yeah, he is. Um, but again, he's uh, yeah, he kicks goals too. He's, he's shown that already in his... in. Um, early in his career that he can do that. So he's a strong, powerful forward and, and you know, he's been impressive in the contest. And you know, I probably thought we've got some really, really capable midfielders, but Archie's a bit different. You know, he's, he's obviously got great attributes, but he's just that you know, strong midfielder um, that complements what we've already got. Free agency is always a big topic and Essendon's got a couple of the best ones on the market in Darcy Parrish and Mason Redmond, have you had a discussion with them about how they've played out or how to keep the noise to, to one side as the, the season goes on? I haven't personally. Um, now, my attitude with that's always been create a great environment, um, show the, the clear direction that, that the team and the club is heading and, and our players have earned their, their free agency status. And so my obligation is to create that world-class football environment and, and um, show direction and a vision for the team and I think if I do that well enough then they'll see their futures here. A couple before we let you go and appreciate your time. So much change at the club across the last six, eight months and the captaincy is the latest one in that as well. Does that add to the, the time and patience that's required for the adjustment period in some ways as well? Yeah, it, it, it does and I think everyone in, in the cold light of day, they understand the facts and you know, the, the, the facts are that we are young, we're inexperienced. Um, but we believe we've got some great capability. So you know, I think we're capable of doing some good things, but the challenge is gonna be consistency of performance. And you know, the, I think everyone understands in, in pre-season that it's gonna be a challenge and it's gonna take some time, but you know, it's, it's how everyone handles that when the inevitable disappointment in season happens. And you know, again, fortunately, I've, I feel like I've been there before and you know, I'm 
ready for that. Have you got a favorite yet? <laughs> well, I think the players think I have. I've, I've mentioned him in this interview, so you can go back over the tape and work it out. <laughs> that nut doesn't narrow it down at all. <laughs> There's about half the list in there. Yeah, go back Any to the clue? start. No, I, I've, got, I've just got a lot of time for the guys who, you know, clearly the, the talented players and the early picks and you know, the, the players that have been really good players all through their juniors, you know, ev everyone knows them and, and loves them. But I've got a lot of time for the guys who persist, work really, really hard, um, get overlooked and then keep persisting and, and come through and, and show some real capability. So that narrows it down for you. John Menzies is going well. <laughs> Face of joy is for John and I, Velda Helen Braden. Good luck for the year. Thanks, Cal.